Hello, everybody. This is again Shakespeare to come with us today. Uh, our very own Yannick Sandefur, um, who is now, I think, uh, officially, and you know, by the book and the staff, the faculty member of the physics department. That's right. Uh, so, this is um, uh, that's his uh, bachelor degree from the University of Saladiki, right uh, from here. And uh, the PhD from uh, Purdue in the United States. He his postdoctoral research at uh, Gutenberg University And since last year, he has uh, been here uh, thanks to the uh, actual grounds. And today he will talk to us about searches of dark matter, which we want to hear you uh, about. So, we need to have a further ado. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to start here. I came here 10 months ago and I'm really a public employee, so I'm two times more excited than yesterday. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it's great. Uh, so I would like to tell you about uh, a bunch of experiments we did uh, using atomic spectroscopy in the previous years uh, during my postdoc time to search for specific dark matter uh, candidates. And so I come, my background is atomic physics. And so here we have at least one one part of the physics as I understand them. A lot of astrophysics, and I'm just a guy who measure atoms with lasers. So a lot of different languages here to to try to to, to cross over from one one, one subgroup to each other. And so I, I hope we can do this. My my language is simple uh, because I'm uh, because I'm an experimental. It's relatively simple. Uh, and so what 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 are we trying to set up here in Crete is a lab where we uh, exploit uh, precision in atomic spectroscopy and molecular spectroscopy to some extent. Uh, to study fundamental physics, um, particle physics, but also nuclear physics. Um, that, that's mainly done through this uh, uh, atomic particle violation project that I'm continuing here uh, with the help of the NRC grant I got uh, a while ago. And so that's my main research activity, but I also have to do other stuff and I'm very interested in doing other things as well. One of them has been this uh, studies of fundamental constant variations in atoms and molecules um, um, that relate to the search for dark matter. And then there's another project here that we are uh, about to start. This is now going a little bit into solid state physics. This has to do with uh, doing magnetometry using uh, spins which are confined in uh, nanomaterials and materials. That's a different thing which is, has not been uh, implemented yet, but we are headed in this, this direction here. Right, so uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's our workhorse. This is the machine I used in mines. I set up and used in mines years ago to study atomic party violations. So this is a, Looks fancy, but it's an old school experiment where you have an atomic beam of an atom called determinant that you excite with lasers and try to measure the effects of the weak force in atoms in a very, very precise way. And we succeeded in doing that, measuring these effects a while ago, a few years ago. Uh, and now my goal is to continue research, set up this apparatus here and quick from scratch almost and continue this, this business here. Um, and this is to study particle physics, but also a little bit nuclear physics. That's my main research activity, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Okay, that's, that's to be clear. Um, right, so yeah, it might be the time to hide this thing at the top. Not this one. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, so just as a brief maybe consideration here, how, how can we search for new physics? So there are, of course, many ways. Um, most of new physics has been discovered in fundamental physics, I mean, in colliders, right? For example, here you see. You have a large hadron collider at CERN, which found, uh, discovered the Higgs boson. And now, particle physics is a little, little bit of a crisis because uh, we don't know if taxpayers will provide more money for an even bigger collider to be constructed within our lifetime. And so, uh, of course, there are other ways to alternative ways to look for new physics. I don't need to emphasize the importance of astrophysics here uh, in this uh, search for new physics. And of course, LIGO, which has seen great successes as soon as it was turned on a few years ago. Uh, we have uh, neutrino observatories, neutrino experiments, uh, large detectors that seek to study, for example, neutrino oscillation from cosmic neutrinos, and that will also tell us hopefully something about um, um, the fundamental physics uh, in the next de decades. And then we have, well, from my point of view, uh, atoms and molecules and lasers too, uh, that we can, uh, we can we can study atoms and lasers using uh, atoms and molecules using lasers uh, in order to. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, probe uh, fundamental physics. So here, in this business, we exploit the exquisite precision allowed by uh, atomic physics and these, these precision measurements uh, to, to probe new physics. 
and uh, sorry. So it looks like my uh, this doesn't change slides anymore, and it doesn't slides change slides from here either. See so now. Okay. So before uh, starting uh, uh, the discussion about dark matter, I'd just like to give you an example of why I think uh, employing Cartesian allowed in atomic systems is good for uh, checking fundamental physics. So what you see here is standing wave um, um, created by light uh, confined in, a, in a, an optical resonator. Uh, this uh, standing wave uh, creates you know, what we call an optic acid, optical lattice clock. So atoms here, in this experiment sitting in Boulder, Colorado, are confined in these uh, antinodes of uh, uh, the optical field. So we have atoms trapped, and we can shine a laser and measure the transition frequency, one of their transition frequencies. And because these transition frequencies are very well defined, we can call this transition as a clock. It has its own ticking rate. OK, so this is an ultra-sensitive, uh, can be an ultra-sensitive way to, to build a clock, to measure the frequency of a transition of an atom or a molecule. And this clock is so good that it, it can measure it can measure the difference in the transition frequency between two two of these points here, which differ in height by a millimeter. Okay, and uh, as we know from DR general relativity, uh, there is time dilation with gravity, so the, the accuracy of this uh, the precision I guess of this clock is so good that we can resolve uh, differences in the ticking rates of subgroups of atoms that differ in height by a millimeter. So this is, in my opinion, impressive. So there's spectroscopy here. And the resonance frequency depends very sensitively on the positions here. Okay, so we can we have a way to check gravitation at the one millimeter. Okay, so that's in my opinion a very good example about why uh, precision physics with atoms and molecules can be good for uh, uh, advancing fundamental physics. Uh, of course, my talk is about dark matter, so I will uh, briefly go through the evidence, some of the evidence that we have uh, relating to the existence of dark matter. Uh, I will discuss certain candidates. Uh, for dark matter, and explain a little bit what dark matter may be and what models we assume uh, to do our searches in the lab, uh, and then I will uh, discuss how we can uh, how dark matter might affect fundamental constants of nature, like the fine structure constant or the electron mass, and then I will uh, go to uh, the experiments uh, and explain how we do them and uh, tell you a little bit about experimental results and where this state, uh, what is the state of this field. Uh, right now, as we are talking. Right, so uh, what, what evidence do we have about dark matter? Of course, we know that galactic rotation curves, uh, uh, the, the rotational velocities of uh, objects in gal spiral galaxies do not drop as one over the square root of the distance. Uh, so more mass is needed compared to uh, uh, what, what uh, we get from uh, estimate from the observation of luminous matter from the electromagnetic radiation. So this rotation curves flatten out at high uh, distances from the nucleus, so more mass is needed that doesn't emit light. Okay, so, um, and then of course there is uh, the anisotropy of the uh, micro cosmic microwave background. So of course there are precise, very precise measurements of the distribution of temperature, the black body radiation uh, temperature of the universe, and there are these small anisotropies that can be analyzed. And, um, uh, these these uh, these analyses to be explained to explain this will require more mass than what's uh, than what's uh, um, uh, what we, we estimate that uh, exists, especially in the in the early universe. Yeah. Uh, so dark matter is, is needed to explain uh, this the fluctuation in this temperature. So that's another strong observation. And then of course there is gravitational lenses. So you've seen that before, most of you. Um, there, this is the uh, this uh, this color here shows a uh, uh, represents the, the matter distribution in the so-called bullet cluster, and uh, the uh, the counter here represents a uh, uh, mass distribution based on gravitational lensing from objects in the background of this cluster. And so the mass is really distributed as shown in the counter, not as it is shown by these colors. Here's more mass uh, than just the luminous mass is needed in order to um, um, to explain this gravitational lensing. So there is very strong evidence, direct observational evidence from astrophysics about the, uh, the presence of dark matter. And of course, this dark matter is uh, about five times more abundant than ordinary or luminous matter. Yeah, so it's about 27% of the, the, the total uh, mass energy in the universe. Ordinary matter is about 5%. Of course, thanks to astrophysics, we have an even bigger problem to understand 
dark energy in here. Uh, I guess for dark matter, there are, there's, there are plenty of good ideas about what dark matter might is, but as far as I understand things, there aren't so many such many good ideas about dark energy. So this, this is a, anyway a big problem by itself to, to explain origin properties and composition of dark matter. And I see here that I'm too quiet. Uh, is that okay? I, I don't know. Let's turn off. Uh, Okay. Right, so I mean, the, the concept of dark matter has been around for many, many decades, and uh, um, uh, there have been experiments set up to try to, to probe uh, dark matter in terrestrial, in terrestrial, terrestrial laboratories. And the, the first big candidate has been WIPs, Winkling Interactive Massive Particles. Uh, which with mass in the 10 to 1,000 giga AV mass, and these were searched, of course, and not found over many decades. And so uh, it looks like dark matter may not be uh, WIMPs, or if it is WIMPs, then they don't interact strongly enough for us to detect, so we should go look for other possibilities. And so what this shows here um, uh, is basically a map of possibilities for uh, what dark matter may be. So each, each color shows a different class of scenarios, and each, each circle shows a subgroup of uh, scenarios here. So there are many, many possibilities about the, uh, the, what dark, dark matter might be. And um, this is uh, the scenario we examine in our experiments. We, we consider dark matter to consist of light bosonic particles. Uh, again, here we have many, many possibilities. It can be something called the QCD axon or axon, other axon-like particles that have properties similar to the QCD axon or ultralight uh, particles called quasi dark matter, but we we uh, we uh, discuss from now on this, this possibility here. So this is one of the other prominent possibilities for the what dark matter might be, uh, except winds. And uh, briefly, what 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 can we extract from our observations uh, uh, with regard to dark matter? So from taking rotation galaxy curves of our galaxy. The rotation curves of our galaxy, we know that the dark matter has a density of locally here around, around, around the planet of about half a giga AV per cubic centimeter. So that's about half a proton or half a hydrogen atom per cubic centimeter. It's not much. But over, of course, our astronomical scales, it dominates over ordinary matter. Uh, we know it has a virial a velocity of about 10 to the minus 3 C, where C is the speed of light. And uh, so it's non-relativistic. Okay, so it's uh, from whatever models we consider, we have to uh, put put it down from the beginning. That it's not it's not relativistic. Uh, now, if we can find ourselves uh, in our uh, considerations in for mass in masses mass range lower than 10 eV, then the dark matter particle has to be a boson. So fermions cannot uh, reproduce. Uh, uh, fer fermions uh, with mass lower than 10 eV would be too fast. We have velocities too fast for them to remain confined in our galaxy. And so um, that's because the Fermi velocity of light fermions is bigger than the escape velocity from our galaxy. So if we confine ourselves to discussing below 10 EV, then we can build models only related to bosons. And then uh, this uh, dark matter has to, particle has to be, um, have to be coherent over the Bradley wave section. And so that gives us a, a Q factor for these dark matter particles of 10 to the 6. Um, and then uh, we, we can make a simple consideration here that the dark matter particle has to, the, the, the field, the, part, the, the, the wave associated with this particle has to be confined in galaxies. Therefore, there is a minimum uh, mass that uh, one has to consider in order for the particles to be, yeah, okay. of course. I understand the same sequence of things, but the second sequence, why the last uh, the third. Why Oh, we don't have to assume that. It's just that if it is 10 you mean above and then we can do an experiment yeah, yeah, yeah. going up with test yeah. this part. So, yeah. So, 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 yeah, so all this category, this is a light bosom here. Yeah, you cannot build the yeah, I guess I guess you cannot it's not easy to build a model where you can assume at the same time fermions with bosons, yeah. Or, so, yeah, so in order for the, the particles to be confined in the galaxy, we have to assume a minimum range for the, their mass. And now we 
when we come to the CAT and actual models, and this is the part that we uh, can not go into detail. Uh, so we assume light bosons here, but this can be can have scalar or pseudo scalar vector interactions. And so we have different uh, theoretical models to consider. The most prominent one is the so-called QCD axiom, which was introduced about 45 years ago to solve a strong CP uh, problem to explain why there is so such a small CP violation um, in the strong interaction. So this is a this is the focus of activity within slide within this light bosonic dark matter research. Uh, and then one can uh, check out what, what uh, observables this gives. So this uh, torques uh, spins, nuclear spins. Uh, one can consider other interactions. For example, uh, an interaction where the QCD action in the presence of a strong magnetic field is converted into a photon. So you can get light out of nothing. Uh, so there are, there are experiments for this action photon conversion. Uh, these axons can uh, create effective magnetic field, oscillating magnetic field, where the oscillation happens at the, the oscillation frequency, the mass of the particle. And so one can uh, build up a very sensitive atomic magnetometer and try to look for this uh, effective magnetic fields created by axons. So there's, there's a whole zoo of effects here. Uh, what we de deal with in the, the, the studies I will discuss, uh, I refer to this first uh, uh, class of scenarios where the dark matter particle has scalar interaction, so it's either the, uh, it's something called the relaxant that couples to the Higgs, or it's something called the dilaton. That, yeah, and the, what, what's the, what's the uh, main, there is no earthquake, right, this is moving. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what's the main uh, effect here, a fundamental concept of nature pick up small uh, oscillation at the frequency of the dark matter particles. And so how can we check for these oscillations? We can check them using atomic clocks. Uh, molecular clocks, uh, laser interferometers, so atomic, molecular, and optical physics techniques are great for these uh, these these checks. Uh, people have also used the uh, the GPS satellite uh, network. They have correlated check correlation between signals in order to to probe such variations in, in the past. So there is a, um, th there is again only considering this first uh, group of scenarios, we can do a lot of different experiments to probe variations. Um, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's it's coming up in a couple of slides. That is very lax. It's uh it's a variation of the uh the action theory. It's written, written down by Gilad Peres. Gilad Peres. I will, I will talk about this in a couple of slides. Yeah. So yeah, uh, this is becoming a big field of research to study dark matter using uh, I mean light bosonic dark matter and so this map was not populated five years ago but now it's full of uh, experiments um, so uh, different colors here show the different um, different uh, uh, interaction study like the axon the dark photon which is uh, a vector or the, the scalar vector another scalar vector category here so there are many many experiments of differing uh, um, degree of difficulty by maybe uh, up to two orders of magnitude. I mean, LIGO is trying to detect fundamental constant variations, but our CT spectroscopy setup in the lab tries to do the same. Okay, so the, these the experiments, uh, some of them are quite easy. And so there are many, many activities uh, uh, building up around the world. And uh, of course, uh, somehow they have to have funny names. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the state of it. I think like Mad Max is my favorite here. Um, yeah. And they published a nice paper though, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not down, it's down, not down. <laughs> it's down. Cataramen. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, the point here is that there are many, many different activities We're looking for different scenarios. Again, with uh, apparatus uh, uh, that differ in difficult complexity by one or two orders of magnitude, also in amount of money that it takes to put together and uh, experiment and effort. Right, so for this fundamental concept of relations here, we consider two different theoretical models. One is a Dilaton model. Uh, so Dilaton comes from string theory. And uh, a seminar of Anitaki about a decade ago so that these dilatons can uh, introduce uh, uh, oscillations in the fundamental constants in the, if these dilatons make up dark matter or part of dark matter. Uh, so this is one 
one theoretical scenario that we consider and the other is this relaxing now. So this relaxing model was developed by uh, Graham and Kaplan and others uh, also about a decade ago to solve the hierarchy and strong, strong CP problem. Uh, so this was actually a PRL which was 16 page long. PR, yeah, so somehow it was kind of important for the community. Um, and then um, Gilad Perez uh, in the Weizmann Institute shortly after saw that this, let's take this relaxing and see if we can make up um, the right properties or we can build a model so that it can uh, um, accommodate dark matter. And, and they saw that it could be. And uh, now this relaxing is supposed to couple to the Higgs and through that affect the fundamental constants of nature. And of course, the builder models. And uh, within this model, one can consider that um, uh, one, one is allowed to consider that the, uh, the relaxing halo, dark matter halo, can be trapped around um, the sun or big, big, big mass in the big objects in the, in the galaxies, therefore giving us an enhancement in the, the possible detection that we can uh, have because the density is increased, this, this uh, dark matter halo gets trapped. So this relaxing is a good thing for us. <laughs> um, yeah, more more, de more details, of course, you go, uh, actually, yeah, you go to the papers, yeah. Um, right, so we assume that dark matter uh, makes our fundamental constant oscillate. So the, uh, the dark matter particles are expected because they are very light and they are bosons, they're expected to add up together and make a field which is uh, quasi coherent. And so they make this, uh, classical field that oscillates at the frequency omega, which is basically the frequency of the dark matter, the underlying dark matter particle. And the amplitude here depends on the mass of the dark matter particle. So the, the point is that these particles add up together, making a classical field, which can couple to the, to the fundamental constant. So for example, here's the electron mass. Okay, it means the, the time independent, the mean mass. And then we assume a coupling, linear coupling, of the field to the uh, to the electron mass uh, with this coupling DME. Okay, so uh, phi is the field and the blue uh, blue parameters, parameters in blue uh, characterize the coupling. For example, to the electron mass, the fine structure constant or the strong core uh, coupling constant. Now the electron mass, of course, we understand what it, what it means. The fine structure constant uh, determines the strength of the electron interaction and the strong force coupling constant among other things determines how heavy a nuclei are yes because the the mass of the nuclei is essentially binding energy uh, of the quarks so that, that's that, that energy has to do with this strong force coupling uh, plant mass yeah good, good question so of course different theorists as Achilles knows they have different ways of writing this coupling so I'm forced to use all of Lots showing different couplings, uh, but they are basically the same, the same thing. You have to yeah, convert them from one form to another. Yeah. So in this form, the, the plant mass is included. Right. So our, our job in the lab is to go check for such oscillations. Uh, so if the field oscillates, then uh, the, the fundamental constant pick up a small oscillatory component. This is written down as a linear coupling. Okay. So the field couples linearly to the to the constants. So how do we detect uh, such oscillation? Well, the idea is to, to compare two oscillators in frequency which have different dependence on the constant. So, for example, a laser cavity, so the frequency that comes out of the, the light that comes out of the laser has some dependence on the constant, depends on the electron mass and the fine structure constant. Um, an atomic transition also depends on the two, these two constants, but it has different dependence. A hyperfine, uh, so I guess an atomic transition that involves an electron jump. So you sign a laser to an atom in the uh, an electron absorbs light and it jumps to a higher electronic state. So then you get the dependence in the transition frequency that goes like this. Or you can consider a hyperfine transition where the, the relative spin between the nucleus and the atom flip. And so this transition has a different dependence on, on the constant. And then you can consider other transitions as well. You can get the molecule and consider the vibrations. Okay, so the vibrations of the molecule have a frequency that depends on the nuclear mass. Uh, as well, or you can consider acoustical uh, an acoustic oscillation, like mechanical oscillation, like uh, an acoustic oscillation of, of a crystal, some some clock, some the quartz crystal. Let's say all these oscillations have some specific dependent on uh, the constant. And so you can maybe uh, by the end maybe maybe you can even have a homework, figure out your own way to to check for fundamental constant oscillations. Uh, 
uh, design an experiment before the end of this talk because everything depends on our it's hard to imagine that something doesn't, some physical parameter does not depend on the contrast, okay? So it's not so intellectual, so difficult to come up with such a uh, comparison. So here is one comparison. Uh, so here is a laser cavity, and in one experiment that I'm going to show you, uh, we compare it to uh, the frequency of an atomic transition. So we have a laser, um, and then we excite the laser an atom, and we do our spectroscopy and compare uh, the, the two frequencies and try to look for relative uh changes in the uh in the, in the in the two frequencies and determine if there is fundamental constant oscillation question yeah what is the frequency of this what do you expect so it's the mass it's the mass of the particle right. yeah i will show you in the next slide how we actually do these things yeah um so for a 10 is this particle this one is this 10 to, 10 to the 15. oh we cannot do 10 to the 15. we don't do a 10 to the 15. We should do it. We, uh, in the lab, we can check up to a gigahertz. So what's a gigahertz? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, then it becomes exponentially more difficult. Yeah. Right. Okay, so. Well, we, 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 uh, there is no, as far as I know, I, I just came here from my laser spectroscopy class and I told the students there is no way to measure light frequency directly at 10 to the 15. There is no instrumentation to measure 10 to the 15 hertz oscillation directly. Yeah, so we can do maybe terahertz. But you, you can buy some devices that measure 100 gigahertz, but that's it. But yeah, there, is no, there are no direct ways to measure oscillation for 10 to the 15. Yeah. Um, yeah, so here is another experiment involving a molecule. Again, we get a laser and excite a molecular transition, which involves a change in the vibrational level. And so now we have sensitivity not only to the electron mass in alpha, but also to the nuclear mass. That's another experiment. And finally, here is a, the most recent one where we now uh, get a quartz oscillator. Quartz is a device, basically every, every watch we have has a quartz in it. I don't have watch. Uh, and it keeps time, okay? It has a ticking rate that depends on the frequency of some acoustic oscillation. And so you can get this frequency and multiply it and uh, build, build a wave that you can use to excite um, a hyperfine transition. So we do this comparison mainly in search for oscillations in the nuclear mass. So, yeah, how do we detect these oscillations now? Well, how, how do our experiments look like? Um, well, in, the sim in a simple form, we have an atom vapor confined here, and we shine a, a laser beam, and we tune the laser beam in frequency so that we excite uh, an atomic transition, say from the ground state of the atom to some excited state. And let's say this is an electronic transition. So this transition frequency is in the visible range. Um, and so if you, we tune the laser frequency so that we match this energy spacing, uh, then we get the electron to jump to the excited state and it stays there for a while and it decays down. Uh, so um, th this absorption of the of photons is what we use as a probe. And so now uh, if we are exactly on resonance with the atom, meaning the laser frequency exactly hits the center of the resonance, then our transmission through the cell is at this point, but more generally, if we sweep the laser frequency around the resonance, then we get this absorption profile. Okay, so that's a spectroscopy, I guess, one one And um, how do we look for uh, relative oscillations between the laser frequency and the atomic uh, transition frequency? Well, we sit on the side. That's the main idea. So we mark the laser frequency here on the side, and then we are at, at the slope. So now, uh, if the laser frequency uh, oscillates relative to the uh, atomic transition frequency, we will see a relative oscillation. That's the idea. Well, we do it a little bit more fancy. We use some oscillation techniques to get a little bit better signal to noise ratio, but that doesn't matter for this discussion. And so, if uh, the relative frequency difference oscillates because we sit on this slope here, uh, we see oscillation, temporal oscillation in the transmission signal. Okay, so it's, a, it's an easy, very easy experiment in principle. And then how do we uh, extract the oscillation frequency, which is we do if we get transform of this time series. Um, yeah, so far we haven't seen any dark matter, that will come later. But that, that's the main idea. Okay, so it's as simple as doing basic spectroscopy that we could actually do in the lab. In fact, when we published our, our, first, our first PRL on this, on this business, we wrote a little description saying that we could even do this in the lab for students if we discover dark matter. Okay, so it's, uh, it's not very challenging as an experiment. Right, so this is uh, the first experiment we did in the ancient past of 2019, before a lot of people had jumped into this field. So uh, we, um, 
we uh, did what I described in the previous slide. We did spectroscopy on atomic cesium, and uh, we did this in the frequency range of 20 kilohertz uh, to 100 megahertz. So this acoustic acoustic to RF frequency range. And the goal here was to uh, look for relative variation between the electron mass and the fine structure constant. And you see here the dependence that the two oscillators have is the same. So in principle, there is no dependence uh, on mass, but the laser actually stops responding at high frequencies. If, ME also, if, the, if the electron mass oscillates, uh, the laser frequency starts responding at high frequencies higher than the, the acoustic cutoff of propagation of waves within our laser cavity. So that, that's a technical thing. But for high, above 100 kilohertz, we can uh, probe for oscillations of the electron mass as well. And so we did this experiment, and you see this is, uh, okay, these are just our data. Um, I'll explain what EP experiments are, but within this uh, big parameter space from 20 kilohertz to 100 megahertz, there were no limits before 2019. Again, okay, this acoustic and audio and acoustic and uh, radio frequency range. So we put the first limits here, that was very nice. And so, but these limits are very weak compared to limits that come from uh, other experiments that involve uh, violation of Einstein's equivalent principle, where one has a torsion balance experiment looks for um, uh, basically a fifth force. Okay, so these are fifth force experiments that right now uh, provide better constraints, but there is progress made uh, in, in direct searches for fundamental constant variations. Uh, as I will show you in a later constraint plot, things are getting better and these limits now are, are approaching the ET limits. Yes. Yeah. All good? So the lines and the upper limbs. Upper limbs, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, we, we, can, we can say that if there is a coupling, so there is a coupling to the uh, fine structure constant of the electron mass, it's smaller on this line. Yeah, so it's and the dash there. Dash area is in this uh, spooky range where uh, we cannot model a resonator well enough to, 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 to say what's the exact dependence on the electron mass. Yeah, so if you go to frequency much higher than the propagation sound waves inside the electron resonator, um, and then you have dependence on, on the electron mass. Well, this is the region of cutoff, and we don't really want to model such a mechanical system, so we don't, we don't really, uh, we are very careful about this in this range. Yeah. Right, so that was the first experiment. Ah, that's how it looks like. So it's, it's this big. So uh, it has a vapor cell with cesium, loaded with cesium inside this magnetic shield. The magnetic shield is good because we can uh, protect our signals from uh, extraneous magnetic fields that put noise and perhaps curious signals. Uh, and this is a laser spectroscopy setup. There is a laser down there, but yeah, but that's, that's uh, the main setup is maybe this big, it's half by half meter. So it's a really, it's, it's an experiment for a master student to do. Um, so that was the first experiment. In the first experiment, you don't care so much, I guess, about the quality of the, uh, the limits you, you, you put, the constraints, because there are no limits before that. Uh, but uh, look, so that was uh, the same. That was the, it's the same parameter space here as what we as in the previous uh, plot, and now it's filled up with experiments within three years. And so, okay, so we did a different. We did a second round in our experiment uh, where we improved our apparatus a bit. In fact, we built two apparatus to do the same season spectroscopy. Uh, apparatus one, and apparatus two here, and uh, if you have two different apparatus, then the spurious peaks that might be dark matter in one for likely will not appear in the other. So you can clean up your uh, experiment a lot by doing this. And so uh, workload drops drastically if you have two machines, in two independent machines. So we did the same uh, experiment, but with optimized parameters, and we didn't see dark matter, so we placed new constraints here. The real limits in our experiment for the electron mass and uh, fine structure constant our experiment um, B, we come from experiment B. And within these three years, a bunch of other experiments published their own, their own data because this became hot because these, these experiments, again, are not very difficult to, to do, at, at least at the beginning. And so we, we had the second, second set of constraints here using this atomic spectroscopy in uh, cesium. And here's another one. Uh, here we, do, uh, we did molecular spectroscopy in iodine. So iodine is a diatomic molecule, um, and uh, here we, we uh, would like to study, we study vibrations, and so we, we excite iodine in one of two different apparatus, uh, excite molecular iodine with a laser, and uh, use transitions in this excitation that involve uh, change in the molecular uh, energy. 
uh, the molecular, the, the, sorry, the vibrational energy of the transition. And so if you have a vibrational uh, uh, a change in the vibrational transition energy, then you get sensitivity to the nuclear mass. Because trans the vibrations depend, the frequency of vibrations depend on uh, the nuclear mass. Okay. And so that was the main idea. And so we did two different uh, experiments. One was in Mainz, where I was working, and the other was uh, in Düsseldorf with our collaborator, Stefan Schiller. We had two different apparatus and checked for oscillations of essentially the nuclear mass oh, in this, this large uh, range of the parameter space that covers uh, seven orders of magnitude. We did from 5 hertz to 100 megahertz. We didn't find dark matter again, but we were able to constrain the strong force coupling constant uh, with experiment A being the experiment at low frequencies, uh, at Düsseldorf and experiment B uh, done in mines by our team. EP tests are again equivalent principle violation experiments. And the different uh, limits here correspond to different scenarios that we consider specifically for relaxions. So if you have relaxions, then you can consider uh, different models where uh, you have, for example, the standard galactic uh, scenario or a scenario where the, the relaxion gets trapped in uh, around the sun, or the relaxion even gets trapped uh, and creates a form of halo around the Earth. And so the density grows. So in your terrestrial experiment, and within these scenarios, you can uh, uh, you, you can get enhanced sensitivity. So how you constrain depends on, of course, on the scenario you, you assume. The most common one is this galactic, standard galactic dark matter halo. Right, so we did this experiment to um, detect mainly for vibrations in the, in the nuclear mass. And we, we placed the first limits uh, on the, in this business, in this uh, big parameter uh, range. And here's the last one uh, that we finished last year. Uh, that was published about 10 months ago. Um, so this is a comparison between a hyperfine transition in uh, atomic rubidium and the frequency of an acoustic uh, oscillator, a quartz oscillator. So the quartz we have in our watches cost a euro. This cost three thousand euros, but it's the same. It's the same. Uh, it's the same uh, instrument. Okay, this one's a little bit more stable this time than the, the quartz we have in our watches. And so we use this quartz to produce a, a six point eight gigahertz microwave that excites the hyperfine transition in the ground state of uh, rubidium. And we did this experiment in vapor set, and uh, uh, our spectroscopy again showed no uh, oscillations of um, the, um, the, the nuclear mass. And so we're able to place limits on the, the strong force coupling constant in this parameter space that ranges from about a millihertz to 200 hertz. And I told you I will not speak about QCD axions and uh, things like that. But while we were doing this, our collaborator, Gilad Ferris, found the connection between uh, second order dark matter coupling uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, cons and uh, um, I guess I should say, he found that the QCD action with consideration of a second order dark matter coupling can give uh, fundamental constant oscillations. So, so far we have assumed that the dark matter field couples linearly to our fundamental constant, but if we add a second order contribution to this coupling, then it turns out that even a QCD action can uh, cause oscillations. So we placed, in fact, the most stringent constraints here um, uh, on the QCD action coupling um, to, um, uh, to matter. And uh, yeah, after a while, there was another experiment that killed our limits, but that, that's, that's, that's the nature of this business. Everything happens quite fast. But for, for some time, we had the best limit um, on the QCD action coupling to the to nuclear mass. So um, yeah, and now we want to continue uh, this experiment. And so uh, the quartz is good as an oscillator, but it's not the most stable. And so that means that we get a lot of noise, especially at low frequencies. So we want to get rid of the quartz, but keep the rubidium hyperfine transition. And so what we are working on is uh, on uh, improving our uh, rubidium uh, hyperfine transition apparatus here in Crete. And then we'll, we want to send this to Düsseldorf to our collaborator, Stefan Schiller, who has state-of-the-art uh, optical cavities that have their own resonance. And if you have a, um, an optical resonator, you can uh, use that with something called the frequency to, to, to produce microwaves. So people actually got the Nobel Prize about 15 years ago for developing this uh, very delicate tool that can convert uh, optical to microwave frequency. That gives us a way to connect it, to, although we don't have a way to, to measure directly optical 
optical frequencies. Yeah. So the point is that if we have a laser reference to this state-of-the-art optical cavity that has a very, very stable optical resonance, uh, through the comb, we can produce a microwave to excite the rubidium vapor and thus have this, this comparison between the cavity frequency and the, the rubidium vapor hyperfine frequency. So that's an experiment um, I want you to right now ongoing. Right, so I told you more or less what I did in the last few years, but there is, of course, a lot more in this business. Uh, so I would like to spend the last part of my talk discussing other experiments, uh, bigger scale experiments uh, that study fundamental constant variations. So this is an example from the GEO 600 interferometer. This is a gravitational wave detector in Hanover. This German is gravitational uh, wave detector. And um, it's a Michelson interferometer. And so it turns out that it does have sensitivity to dark matter only because it has a beam splitter involved in this interferometer. So it's really this half centimeter thin or thick material that gives a, a sensitivity to fundamental constant oscillations for a device which is well, you know, very big. Um, and so how does this work? If fundamental constant varies, uh, then that causes changes in the thickness of the beam splitter and changes in the refractive index of the beam splitter. And so that gives oscillations in the interferometer signal. So um, people from the GEO 600 interferometer analyzed existing data and provided these limits uh, for the variation of uh, uh, the electron mass and the fine structure constant. The, the limits they provided are, are these here shown in, in, uh, in, in green color. So they actually get close to, they have surpassed constraints from one gravitational um, um, uh, for, sorry, from one EP violation experiment, they are getting they are getting close here. And this is our limit. This red here is our limit, actually. Um, yeah, so the, the, the GO600 interferometer provides much, much better constraints in the parameter space that is, it is able to operate. And that's from 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz. Uh, before, at lower frequencies, technical noise is very high, and they, they are not very sensitive. Uh, so that's one, uh, one uh, large-scale apparatus that... Uh, provided uh, limits on fundamental constant oscillations. And so you might wonder where is LIGO? Well, here is LIGO. So LIGO is actually not the best um, um, interferometer for uh, checking fundamental constant variations because, because it has this uh, embedded fabry perot interferometers that more or less, that greatly suppresses the sensitivity of the beam splitter. Yeah, anyway, as I was preparing this slide last Sunday, I, I saw this on the archive. So this is a few days old, okay? So, uh, so they did it. So, uh, the same co-authors who um, published uh, on, I guess, the leading author, and some of the co-authors who published the data based on GO600 uh, just published data on LIGO. And I'm sorry that there are no there are no uh, uh, descriptions here, but this the green limits uh, limits shown in green are the limits from uh, to, to to the electron mass and the fine structure constant from the LIGO apparatus. And uh, you can see that they are competitive for a small part of the parameter space, this part here and this part here. Um, yeah, so I guess there is there will be more to this, this story as uh, data are being taken. Um, and in fact, these data are very uh, old. They, they use data uh, produced many, many years ago, test data for, for LIGO. Uh, it makes for, LIGO makes for a much better picture though, compared to um, the GO600. Okay, well, here's another one. That's that's the most sensitive uh, apparatus to constrain the fundamental constant variations at very low frequencies. And so this is a, a set actually of atomic clocks that operate at PTB, the National Metrology Institute in Germany. And so um, what they did here was to compare the frequencies of two, uh, three, diff three optical transitions, two of them in, in a, an interbium ion. So what they do here, they trap in a single ion uh, in some delicate apparatus, they have it localized in space and they measure transition frequencies, optical transition frequencies, and then they, they have a, a way to compare these frequencies uh, um, for oscillations. And they use these two transitions plus another transition uh, in another atomic clock they have based on strong, strontium, neutral strontium 87. And um, I guess I mentioned earlier that for optical transitions, the transition frequency goes as n electron mass times alpha in this second power, but there is a relativistic uh, factor here that adds in the exponent, which is different for different atomic transitions. Okay, so in fact, even for optical transitions, one can have different uh, sensitivities, especially to, to the fine structure constant. 
So they, they did their comparisons, no dark matter this time either, but they were able to place the most sensitive limits uh, at low frequencies. Now we go from 10 to the minus 9 hertz to 10 to the minus 2 hertz. Okay, So these are very low frequencies. And at these very low frequencies, uh, the, the limits provided by direct searches for fundamental constant variations are more stringent than those from EP experiments. Okay, So um, yeah, at high frequencies, EP tests are more sensitive. Um, so that's uh, that's almost it. And uh, here is the last the last experiment that we'd like to discuss because now this involves large infrastructure. Uh, so there is this uh, European fiber link network. So in many different countries in Europe, like Germany, UK, Switzerland, um, and others, uh, there there is a network of fibers, optical fibers between them. So one can request light from one, you can be in a lab in one country and request light from another country, another lab. And so this. Fiber link network networks very uh, good for fundamental physics as well. So what what's done here is that the National Metrology Institute in Germany and the the uh, counterpart in London in the UK collaborated, and they compared the frequencies of two lasers, which are stabilized in uh, two uh, respective state of the art optical resonators. And uh, if you have the two resonators sitting right next to each other, because they have the same sensitivity each. To fundamental constants, uh, you would see no signal if there is a fundamental constant oscillation. But because they're far away from each other, they're two kil two thousand kilometers far away. It takes time from for, for the light propagate from one to the other from London to Braunschweig, and so the two oscillations are not in phase, which means that you can uh, you you have this this phase shift due to the time delay for propagation of light can give a signal, and so they use this uh, phase shift provided by the long distance between the two laboratories to, to constrain um, uh, specifically here the mass, the, uh, the coupling to the electron mass in the parameter space from uh, uh, 30 microhertz to a hertz or so. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a good example of uh, collaborative work that involves big infrastructure, mm -hmm. at least in my opinion. So um, yeah, and this is the state of the art. So when we started in 2019, we had a couple of limits from state-of-the-art atomic clocks here, this prosium and CIRTE. These were the, um, the the existing limits. And then we did the first ones up at high frequencies. And that was the ancient past. After five years, we see this whole parameter space is populated. And this is now the limit to the to the, the fine structure. Constant, still uh, most equivalent principle violation experiments are more sensitive. Uh, Except the very low frequencies, but progress has been made. So perhaps the LIGO, would, uh, the, the LIGO or GO600 at some point might reach this EP experiment limits. And this is the same picture now for uh, uh, limits uh, provided by uh, pro limits on the electron mass. There are fewer experiments here, um, but the, 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 the situation is, is uh, similar. Yeah, so that's my last uh, slide. So, the last thing I wanted to say is that I was very happy to see that this. <laughs> This is a region of the parameter space that we started populating here is now filled up with uh, more and more results and more are coming uh, by the month, perhaps. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's an exciting field. And uh, I'm sure in a few years from now, this whole region will be uh, full of limits, uh, if, if not detection of dark matter. We'll see about that. Yeah, that's what I wanted to tell you. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your attention. So I see the huge range of mass on the X. Ten to the minus so this is the, the mass of the sensitive um, um, the, you know the particles could be there. Yeah. So if there were one and if it was indeed there, what would I expect to see? Big this uh, would be no plus uh, constraints anymore. We would, uh, you would see a peak, something a metric. No, you would uh, no, you would, uh, no. This is this is the absence of uh, signal. So this is just this is the absence is of signal. We wouldn't show this anymore. No, no, no. Saying uh, what does the signal mean? Uh, you signal. show the strength of some of, 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 of the wire, right? Yeah. So this is the coupling. The coupling. And so we measure the zero coupling between our within our sensitivity. So that's what we are showing here. So if there was a measurement at that mass, there would be a strength with that. 
So it would not be zero. It will be a number to some end. But that sound is not in that start to me, right? So in this pocket, you can hear the same. Yes. Okay, so at this mass, I'm going down to 10 to the minus 8 on this particular. Yeah, I don't know if you see the token, not the plan. Right? Okay. What if for that mass, the strength of the coupling is 10 to the minus 11? Is there a field that you think? You know, whether at that mass it would be 10 to the minus 11, or why do you say there is no evidence? Because it could be 10 to the minus 11. You simply haven't measured. That could be, of course, yeah. So, so there's, there's no theory there's no, that uh, predicts that your y axis should have that value at that mass. There's uh, no theory. Not for these models, no. Not for these models. There, there is, uh, okay, so you can go uh, to natural limits and then uh, you can put a lower limit on what the coupling can be, or you can uh, consider relax, uh, sorry, uh, QCD axis. QCD, uh, for QCD axis, there is a prediction. So you can draw a line. So why didn't you do it? Say that there is no model. There's no model for this. No, no, model. no not, not for relaxing, not for dealing. Let's say I came this year. No, no. Huh? What, what you can do, so, sorry, what you can do is you, you can give up after you don't find it. And then you can go to the next model after 10 years. You don't find anything. Same story with wings. But well, that's the point. What then? The yeah, then we give up. Yeah. This is the limit of our uh, ability to, to detect this or check this model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking the question that the other say we have an X and positive X. What kind of variables does it make in fundamental? So we, we have the fundamental case. What does it bring to standard? Far, yeah. What we learn? What, what's next? So what first of all, learn? yeah. So the, the reason why we have EP experiments and the fundamental constant limits here is because one is equivalent to the other. So if there would be fundamental constant variations, that automatically means EP violation. So Einstein's equivalent physically violated. You have EP violating accelerations. So that's already a big, big, uh, big violation. Um, yeah, and, and then. Uh, and that, that's without even invoking dark matter. Okay, if we see fundamental constant of variation, we automatically we know that we have ET, ET, ET violation without even considering dark matter. And of course, after we invite colleagues to repeat the experiment, make sure it's correct. And, uh, and, and then it's uh, up to the theorists to, to help us uh, do additional experiments. That, that's, that's, that would be my, my thinking. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have, I don't know, do we have theories which would predict the EP violation for the specific examples? There, there are some things, I mean, yeah, that may be. But it would so, so, so much as if the numbers are much greater than we have a bigger problem than the model is great, there are theories. But uh, for breaking the fundamental, like, if you if you detect it, the value would have to be really yeah. Mm -hmm. What what would your take? Like the test, you know, same thing. You mean the QCD action theory? Yeah. So it's not the QCD action theory. Yeah, it could be something that it's not uh, could be an unknown unknown, right? So we are not aware of theories have not thought of yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so not thinking Unless you find something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, uh, why would we need them? Do you know anything about the visa? It's going to be a space based uh, radiation. Radiation based detection. Well, I don't know about visa. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. the next. They have to. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I mean, I've heard of Lisa, but I don't know. Yeah, do you know anything? No. Actually, I don't. And no. another question I mean, about the physics uh, Are there any predictions of this group of uh, dark matter models about the dark matter energy? Mm -hmm. Prediction for the dark matter, hello, is that 
Well, the Le Mans is between 10 and Le Mans 22 or so, you'll be up to. Well, people have looked for wind. I have a mass of up to 1,000 giga EV, at least what, that's what the model is, in terms of the 12 EV. And the lower limit for these bosonic scenarios is 10 to the minus 22, so you have 30 orders of magnitude. Now about the halos, we, I guess, I guess theories make the models where they can be tested. So we consider the, the galactic, or our galactic halo scenario with a given estimated density, yeah. Um, I'm not an astrophysicist, so I, I, I actually, I, I don't know much about dark matter density in other parts of the universe, yeah, so, yeah. So, in other words, Yeah, so there is a set of observables, proposed observables, and uh, that, that, that's, the, that's the recipe provided by theorists to us, yeah? Um, um, so for example, when we consider the QCD action, that can, or its uh, cousin, the action like particles, it can have like three or four different observables we can, okay. we can, uh, we can check. Um, like uh, generate, uh, action to photon conversion, you know, uh, effective magnetic field generation, things like that, uh, or uh, torquing uh, uh, nuclear spins, or um, yeah, so there is a set of observables. And so for the, this, the, the things I discussed, these are the, there, there are two observables as far as, uh, the info, as, as, far as uh, theories tell us. So one is fundamental quantum variation, and the other is EP variation. Well, yes, you are equivalent, yeah. Okay. yeah. So if you measure one, not the other, that's what makes the thing for us. Yeah. Of course, you might have you have a different observables, possibly with different couplings. Yeah, yeah. one has to be careful in what uh, in this discussion. Yeah. Apparatus, but in principle, you need, to find the you need to have it far away from each other. So, so if the oscillation, huh? yeah, it's, it's like, right? yeah, so it's the same as the fiber. It's, yes, but you can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you can signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so oh. you can do it. Yeah, no, no problem. Exactly. We say, it's not like, it's not like, it's like, ah, yes, like, so, I don't know what they do if they have a Because the effect, well, so these are different devices. So we, this, is, this is an optical resonator. Okay, so it has its, its own dependence on the constant, and the the LIGO and the TOS handles are gravitational wave detectors. Big nickel, so interferometers have a different dependence. And here, the okay, so that's a different question. Um, of course. Well, now we have to look at the numbers, but. Uh, so they, they operate at different frequency ranges. So when we talk about sensitivity, we have to uh, discuss a little bit about noise sources. The very low frequencies are bad because you have more noise. Um, I, I would think that this becomes better if you could have these cavities very far apart. Yeah. You need the cable or you need to have them in space and then send a laser from one to the other and you exploit this, again, this time delay. <laughs> But you need to have locally, you need two resonators lock. I mean, you need two uh, small scale resonators connected through light somehow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. But this 
Question is, uh, who's going to populate this? Well, I guess we're talking about we're talking about two cavities, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this 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 parameter space is covered by state-of-the-art clocks, but this parameter space is yet to be populated. Yeah, to be explored. So, yeah. What happened in circles? This this is a euro one euro coin. Yeah. Huh? You can have one of those in the uh, one is okay, one is the frequency comp. Is it's not just that there is a laser, it's, 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 it's a state of the art apparatus. I'm not sure everyone anyone has put a no, no one has put a frequency comp state yet. It's a it's a bit okay. Ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> With collaborators, yeah. It's not my money. We should think bigger. 